Man. So, all the women that have a CD player in your car, stand up. Okay, so let's see. Whoever can say Jesus the loudest is going to get something. Let me hear you. Nairobi. We just did that to locate who had the biggest mouth in here, okay? So that's good. That's good. Now, Ruby, she owns it. She owns it. She All the men who have a CD player in your car, stand up. Stand up if you got a CD player in your car. Anything. All right, I'm going to let you figure out how to give that one away. Okay, now, uh, all the guys, now, we ain't doing no screaming, okay? We don't roll. That is, that's just way out of our comfort zone, okay? So, uh, we just, you know, uh, I want to have the loudest grunt. You're going to have to grunt. I mean, like, just grunt. Huh? What's this? What did he do? I don't watch TV. So, okay, ready? On three, you got to grunt. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Okay, let's do it. Stand back up. Stand back. Jeff, stand back up. Come on. Darius, come on. Now, y'all can bark, I know, okay? So let's do that, okay? Y'all think about the Georgia Bulldogs. And y'all are really good. Y'all, they were getting ready to start it up. Bulldogs all the way. Now, think about a dog that maybe chased you as a kid, okay, or, or whatever. So on three, I want to hear the loudest bark. One, two, three. <laughs> Darius, that was good, though. Thank you, brother. I don't even say I ain't even got a car. Why, why, why is he even in this thing? Y'all gave him a car already? Oh. No, man, we don't. No, that's not how we roll. You know, it's like you go to your place, you say, you know, hey, look, man, uh, is anybody wanting to, uh, uh, I need a volunteer. Will you come up here? And then you see the people do this. <laughs> what the heck? Leave him alone. What about you? I mean, I, and I would pick the one that's doing that. That's what I like to do. Amen. How to leave. Well, guys, we love you guys. And again, I want to just echo what, what they've been echoing about about prayer and uh, coming together as a church. We really are praying and believing God for a move of God in Henry County. And I'm telling you, man, I, I just, I don't know. I don't know when I come, because we're hooking up with another church, Church of the Highlands. So as they're going live, there's hundreds and thousands of people that are joining live at that moment, and we're all praying and seeking God. It's a beautiful experience, okay? It's not a tape-recorded event. We're live, and you see the hands lifted up, and you, you, you hear about the churches all over in other countries that are joining in, okay? So it's a mighty, mighty move of God happening. And again, if you want to see something different, you've got to do something different. I mean, some of us have not even tapped into the potential God has for us you do know that God has way more than what you're in right now for you just like you as a parent have way more in store for your kid they just can't handle it right now and as they grow you give them more and more and more well God is wanting us to grow and the way you grow is you come spend time with him amen so we just want to encourage you to do that uh, do it at home and if you can't do it hey we understand no condemnation just just join us in this 21 days to where you somewhere during the day you kind of put aside a little extra time to just really pray and really really seek God so I wanted the teenagers in here because I'm going to talk about the rapture of the church and we're going to kind of get into some things that I think we all need to think about because I think if you're like me I look around at the world we live in and you can kind of see things are kind of crazy out there there's things happening that we just scratch our head on and go why is that happening you know, there's things, you know, there's, there's wars uh, overseas. You got Ukraine and Russia. Oh, why is that going on? Why hasn't Russia already obliterated Ukraine? Could they do that? Could they make Ukraine a, a, just a, a wasteland? Yeah, they could, just like that. You know, but they don't do it. Why this prolonging? Why is the river Euphrates drying up? You know, why are these things happening? Just un, un common things that are going on and, and, and it's because prophecy is coming to pass things that the bible said would happen the things that god said in the old testament is beginning to happen in the book of revelations you are currently living in in, in revelations chapters one uh through three you're living in that moment right now okay this is where we are and we're just a few seconds away from jesus coming back and gathering his church but yet we live as though that ain't never going to happen. I'm talking about church people. 
That's what's kind of concerning to me. Is the is the uh, what is it? The compromise, the complacency, even amongst God's own children. They think they can do whatever they want to, and they're excluded from from not going to heaven. And that's the scary part. And I'm going to share some stories today from the Old Testament that's going to actually show a beautiful example of what I'm talking about. There's people that go to church all the time. They talk like a Christian. You know, they somewhat act like a Christian in church, but then they leave and they think they're fooling somebody. And you ain't fooling nobody. You sure ain't fooling God. But then again, sometimes we, we serve God with this mentality that he is a mean God. That if you mess up, he's going to beat you over the head with a stick. Listen, your parents on their best day of loving you don't even come close to how much God loves you. So you just pick any day, parents, of how you really love your baby. And God's a thousand times greater than that towards everybody in this room. He loves you. He's never going to hit you over the head with a hammer. Even though you may need to be hit over the head with a hammer. And some of us do sometimes need to be hit over the head with a hammer. So last week we talked about four evidences to why we're living in the last days. Today I want to talk to you about the rapture of the church. And we're going to start in first. I would like to have everybody repeat it after me, but I, I want to get it out first. First Thessalonians. Come on. I did it. That's good, y'all. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. We're going to start right there, and then we're going to just kind of run through this thing. And I, and I hope to bring some clarity to you of how these things are happening. Because, again, as I start this message, when you talk about the rapture of the church, you have church people that believe different things. Okay? You have some people that believe in the pre-trib. That means the rapture of the church going up before the tribulation. Then you have some people uh, that preach uh, mid-trib. That means you're going to hang around for a few years, and then we're going to leave out of here in the middle of it. Okay? And then you have some people, now I don't know about, I, I'm not a part of that group, okay, that believe it's going to be post-trib, that you're going to go through all seven years. There's nothing about Revelation 6 through 19 I want anything to do with. And if you'll ever take the time to read it, you would probably give me a high five and go, amen, brother. I don't want to be there, okay? I personally believe the rapture of the church, based on Scripture, not opinion, because I'm going to show you today in the Word that we're going out of here on the first call, okay? We're not hanging around. I don't want to hang around in the middle of the tribulation, okay? I have no desire. If they're going to be up in heaven having a seven-year marriage, supper of the Lamb, and a party, how many of y'all like to miss parties? Because the party that's going to be going on down here is going to be terrible. It ain't going to be a party. It's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to not be good. So let's start with verse 13, chapter 4. And y'all lean in, take notes, man. The Holy Spirit will speak to you during these messages. And it says, and now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died. So, so, so he's going to let us know what happens to the believers that die. Did you know that everybody that dies is not a believer? And that's the sad part about it, man. When I have to go to a funeral and, and, and there's people that are not sure whether they knew God or they didn't know God, I mean, that breaks my heart because not all people are going to heaven. But you'll hear the world talk like, oh, they went to a better place. We'll see them again. I know they're up in heaven. But yet down here they live like the devil. Now, again, we don't know what happens in those last moments. We don't know. But this passage right here, Paul is letting us know really clear we can know what happens to the believers who have died. So you will not grieve like people who have no hope. That's why I say, that's why I say here all the time, when Nathan dies, don't ever come in here and be sad. <laughs> you better be, man, wow, he did it. Belinda, he's on the other side. He's in heaven. Whoa, he's having a good time because I am. I don't want to look down out of heaven as one of those witnesses in the Hebrews 12 going, what are y'all doing? I'm up here partying, man. Come on, chill out. Y'all can have hope when you know somebody knows God. Amen? Verse 14, for since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. Who they tell it from? Directly from the Lord. This ain't coming from man. This is coming from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. So the died people are going to, they're going to get, they're going to be first. 
So it's almost like, man, I might want to just go ahead and die. I want to be first. Who wants to be second? I mean, nobody wants to be second. I want to be first, okay? So the dead people, they're going to be the first ones. Hallelujah. They're going to get their glorified bodies. Ain't y'all ready for a, a redo? <laughs> Come on. Y'all be looking in the mirror sometimes, man. Don't you just think about, man, what's my glorified body going to look like? What's that bad boy going to look like? I'm thinking six-pack all day long. You know what I'm saying? I'm thinking, man, some nice big arms. Hallelujah. I'm really thinking about that, you know? And I hope God's thinking about that. <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. Hey? Amen. It says uh, in verse 16, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from the graves. Can't wait to see that happen. So I guess we'll get to see that happen first. And it's all going to happen so quick. So, I mean, man, if you happen to be hanging out in the graveyard that day, you're going to get a good, good snapshot of some things. Amen? And then verse 17 says, Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be what? Everybody say that. Caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord for how long? For just a little while? No, forever. So he says, so encourage each other with these words. So we as believers, when we see chaos and turmoil in the world going in a wild, crazy place, know this, Jesus prophesied, and we talked about it last week, he told us these things was going to happen. So they're going to happen. And you can pray all you want to to remove some of these things. They are part of prophecy, and they're going to happen. That's why when you pray, you have to have prayer targets. You have to pray what the Holy Spirit wants you to pray. Because if you're trying to pray against something that God says is going to happen, <laughs> you blowing hot air, baby. <laughs> you ain't gonna, it ain't going to happen. So there is things that's going to happen on this earth that we ain't going to like, okay, but we just need to know it's going to happen. Now, we can do our part in, 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 in maybe hopefully slowing some of it down a little bit, okay? But the phrase caught up is where we get the word rapture. Rapture is not used in the Bible, but it means the same thing. The Greek word or the Greek meaning of caught up is harpazo. It's the word harpazo, which means to seize, to catch up, to snatch away. Same concept. I mean, it's, whether you say caught up or rapture, it's got the same concept. It's, it's pulling it up. It's seizing it. It's snatching it away. The rapture of the church is the next big event on God's calendar. The rapture of the church is a signless event. That's something I said last week. There will be no signs given when Jesus is going to come. Why? Because he don't even know. <laughs> How's he going to let anybody know if he don't know? So it's a signless event. Now what Jesus said, we'll be able to see some signs to let us know. We'll have some billboard signs, like we talked about last week with the earthquakes. And all. We'll see some billboards out that are kind of letting us know, coming soon. Coming soon, the Son of God. He's coming, okay? But we don't know the day or the hour at all. So if somebody comes to you and says they know the day or the hour, you know not to listen to them, okay? Because if the one coming don't know the day or the hour, what the heck are you doing listening to somebody that does know the day or the hour? Amen. We do not know when it's going to happen. Jesus does not even know the hour or the day. Matthew 24, 36. Let's hear it from his lips, you know, personally. He says, however... In verse 36, no one knows the day or the hour when the, these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. And you know something I, I love about the Father, unlike people? Have you ever told somebody a secret and then somebody else found out about it? Or am I the only one? Hey, man, don't tell nobody. <laughs> but by the time, <laughs> the end of the day, somebody already knows. God keeps really good secrets. That means you can go to him and talk to him about your deepest, darkest struggles, and he will not tap your neighbor on the shoulder and go, hey, have you heard about your neighbor? He's a freaking lunatic. God don't do that. But people do. That's why we want to pray. We want to take personal things to God, not each other, until you find some people that you can trust in your life. And you need to have those people in your life, but be careful. Test them with something that don't matter if it comes back to you. I always start small, okay, and just see what happens. He said, only the Father knows. Verse 27, when the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, so he's going to tell us, Jesus is going to tell us what was going on right before the flood, okay? He says, 
that there were people enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat. They're partying. They're having banquets. I mean, they're having a good time. Cookouts, barbecues. I mean, it's absolutely on. We're having a good time. And every day they're probably walking by and seeing this nutcase, you know, the church, preaching that God's going to, he's destroying the earth, y'all. Hey, y'all come help us. Come on, man, come to church. Come on, receive Jesus. Man, the rain's coming. The flood's coming. Hell's coming. Come on, guys, get in church. We see that today, right? I mean, us leaves the building and we compel those that don't know him to come into the ark or the boat or the church to come in to know Christ. But I'm busy. I got other things to do. I'm not big on religion. Oh, man, I need to straighten some things out. It's the same conversations that Noah was seeing, okay? Same things, all right? Same people, basically just different time periods. So they're partying. They're having a good time. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. And see, people ain't going to realize until they hear the trumpet, and all of a sudden, there's people missing. Now, friend, I, I, I don't, I'm not excited about that day because I know it's going to hurt a lot of people. And the one I know it's going to hurt, it's going to hurt Jesus. The one who died for people. He's the one that's going to see a lot of his creation stay behind. And he knows what's in store for them. So if you think that it's just going to be a good day only for him, it's not. It's going to be a sad day for him as well. But he says, he goes on to say, that is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Two men will be working in, together in the field. One will be taken, the other left. There'll be five people on the basketball court, Darius. Man, come on, man. And then the guard, he'll throw it to the, to the next guy, and he's gone. Where'd he go? He ain't here no more. I mean, I was getting applause by a lot of people, but now there's only 25 people in a 19,000-seat auditorium. This is reality, y'all. It's going to happen. Going to be on the football field. The quarterback goes back. He ain't saved. Oh, man, you know, he looks left. He sees right and he throws it. And the ball's in the air to the receiver. And then he disappears. I mean, this, this is going to happen. It's going to be going on all over the world. You're going to be at work and, and you're going to be bagging groceries, you know, working. And, and they, they're going to slide the groceries. You're going to grab it and then you're going to look up and the cashier's gone. Out of here. The sad part about it is it's going to be moms and dads changing the baby's diaper. Baby gone. Baby gone. It's a reality, y'all. That's why if you're in here and you ain't living for the Lord, I hope this message scares the hell out of you. Literally. And I mean that literally. Because hell is a real place. And heaven is a real place. And if there's no other reason while I'm pastoring and I'm on this, and again, I'm not chasing numbers even though I'm chasing people. I'm not about, you know, how big we can be. I'm about people getting to know Jesus and going to heaven. You can hate my guts as long as you go to heaven. I don't know how that works in the Bible. Well, you you got to love me a little bit anyway. But the reality is I don't preach to please. I preach so you can experience heaven. Amen? I want you not to miss that. I don't care if you miss a lot of things in life. You may think you've got to be there. You may think you can't miss some things in life. And again, I know there's important things. But man, one thing you don't want to miss is heaven. You don't want to see your baby going up. And if you're listening to me on Facebook, you may be in that position right now. Or if you're listening to me on YouTube, you may be in that position right now. You ain't serving God. You ain't going to church. And you have little kids. Just know you do not want to see your kids go up and you stay left behind. It's going to be a sad, sober day. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. So you too must keep watch. This is Jesus talking, y'all. For you do not know what day your Lord is coming. Understand this. If a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, click, click, <laughs> you ready, okay? Got that gun ready. He would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be ready all the time for the Son of Man will come when least expected. Oh, we're good. We're good. We're all right, man. We're good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. And then, boom. 
Husband comes home from work and his family's not there. Whoa. That's going to be a wake-up call. <laughs> Wife comes home from work. Her family's no, no longer there. Maybe she just left Applebee's and had a few drinks with her friends while the dad was taking the kids to church. But, you know, she was busy doing things, you know, chasing money, getting that raise, impressing that boss. And now you're here for good. <laughs> you're going to go through hell. All for what, a paycheck? All for some more stuff, things, or position? Sorry. <laughs> Let me tell you something. There ain't nothing on this world keeping me out of that. I'm telling you, I'm going up in the first load. And I hope I'm in a room full of people going to go up with me. Amen? Amen? I ain't left behind. And that can happen at any moment. Any moment right now. It can happen right now. There ain't nothing else that's got to happen for it to happen right now. Nothing. He could come back right now. And you say, well, you know, all people groups need to hear the gospel. Do yourself a favor and go home and check on the deadliest island in the world. And this deadliest island is located right outside, or really it's off the coast of India. India has the rights to it, and they have forbidden anybody to go to this island. I forget the name of it, but you just pull it up. It, it'll, it'll come up there, okay? And the, what makes it deadly is there's a tribe of people that live on there, okay, that do not let anybody come to the island. They've killed a missionary that tried to go to the island in the early 2000s. They don't want any help from anybody, okay? They've had helicopters go out there, and they're shooting bows in there, and, they don't want, and they've just kind of just come to the conclusion because it's a heavily wooded and mountainous area, so they don't even want to go out there. So th nobody goes out there. That's a people group that nobody knows anything about because they will not let them on that island. You can look it up. There's documentaries on it all over. Just pull it up, watch it. I mean, it's really impressive, to be honest with you, the, how they've lived there. Now, they said they've been living there 60,000 years. That's why I tuned them out right there, man. We wasn't made 6,000 years ago, man. What you talking about? But the, the, needless to say, they've been living there for a long time. So there's going to be people groups that won't hear the gospel, okay, before the rapture. But they're going to hear the gospel somewhere in the midst of that seven-year tribulation, okay? And I don't want to get into all that. I could, and I love to, because I love the book of Revelations. And to me, it's the simplest book on the planet. If you just read it, <laughs> people are scared to read it, but it's the only book that comes with a blessing if you read it. The only book that he says, blessed is the reader who reads this book. So you want to read the book of Revelations. And it's a really short book. It's not long, but it really is impressive. Hallelujah. Jesus returned to gather the church or his bride will come at a time when least expected. So we need to be watching and ready to come when he returns. Let me ask you this. Have you ever had to wait on someone to get ready? Uh-oh. We're going to hit some nerves right here. Have you ever asked somebody, hey, look, I'll be there at 10 o'clock to get you, only to find you have to wait on them to come out to your car? Moms and dads, have you ever told your kids, we need to be ready to go at 9 o'clock? But yet, they're not ready at 9 o'clock. Okay? I mean, have you ever had some friends in your life that you, you, you say, hey, look, we need to be here at this certain time or, or we're going to be late, but yet you have to wait on them? How do you feel in that moment? It's not good at all. Just like your boss, if you're supposed to be there at 10 and you get there at 1030, how's that going to go over? Ain't going to go over too good the long term. He may let you buy one or two times, but, but again, nobody likes to wait on anybody. When Jesus splits those skies, he's not coming down here and, and sit in a waiting room. Wait a minute, Dwayne should be here in just a minute. Yeah, he'll be here. Y'all hang on, we're going to go to heaven in just a minute. Got a few more people coming. No, no, <laughs> no, it's done. And that's the way some of you guys need to be. Now, let me ask you this. Now, have you ever... Been there to pick them up, or you met somebody there, they wasn't there, and then you had to leave, leave them. If you did that, and I've done that, I was a coach of a baseball team. Left my son at home because he wasn't ready. Was that easy? No. Broke my heart. He didn't like it, and I didn't like it. So when Jesus comes back, he's going to get his people. Do you think he's going to like leaving them behind? He ain't going to like it, and they ain't going to like it. That's why he's given us grace in a time period. To get right with him. 
Hallelujah. Hey, don't let me forget to share with y'all one day about some people say once saved, always saved. Have y'all heard that? Once saved, always saved. I may share some of that here, but I, I got Bible on that because that's, 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 um, according to the Bible, that's not true. And you're going to see this even in a little bit of this lesson today. Does the Bible give us types and shadows of the rapture of the church? Yes, it does. Genesis 5, 21. Let's start there. When Enoch was 65 years old, I'm almost there. I'm 55. I won't live as long as he did, but at that point, that looks, that's a number I can reach. He became the father of Methuselah. Anybody ever heard of Methuselah? Man, you're as old as Methuselah. You've heard them things, don't you? My God, man, you're as old as Methuselah. Man, what you got, man? That, man, man, that car's as old as Methuselah. Man, what you talking about, you know? Methuselah was the, the, the longest living human ever, okay? But there's some interesting facts about Methuselah I think you're going to enjoy. And it says, after the birth of Methuselah, Enoch lived in close fellowship with God for, for another 300 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Enoch lived 365 years. How many days do we have in the calendar? Cool, man. All right. Walking in close fellowship with God. Then one day he disappeared because God did what? Rapture. Seized him up. Caught him up. That's a picture of the righteous being lifted off the earth. Because God saw that there was a flood coming. He knew what was going to happen. All right? So he was walking with Enoch. So how, wouldn't you like that, man? You just out there. Just chilling out, Jeff. Just, just on the golf course, maybe. Just hanging out. Talking to God. And next thing you know, I, I know. <laughs> Terrica, well, I wouldn't like it. But <laughs> Jeff's no more. <laughs> God's called him up. But again, for Jeff, okay, it would be an awesome thing. That you're spending time with God. And I think it's not looking at it from a literal standpoint that he's going to snatch you up. But there is a, a principle that you can get that when you're spending time with God, he will lift you up above all this stuff going on in your life. He'll give you some stuff and then set you back down to where you can actually be effective, more effective on the earth. So he disappeared. God took him. Enoch was taken out of here. All right, that's one picture of the rapture. But I want to go on and share a little bit more about this Methuselah guy, Okay. When Methuselah was 187 years, this is in Genesis 5, 25. When Methuselah was 187 years old, he became the father of Lamech. Everybody know Lamech? I ain't even never heard of Lamech, most of y'all. How many of y'all don't know Lamech? Raise your hand. Okay, be honest. Some of y'all just act like y'all know Lamech, right? Okay, y'all don't know Lamech. Uh, I didn't know Lamech, okay? He ain't even interested in me. I like Methuselah, and I like the guy coming after him, all right? Nope, no, no offense, Lamech. I mean, I, I love you, brother. But after the birth of Lamech, Methuselah lived for another 782 years, Josh. What's up? This guy's kicking, man. Hallelujah. And he had other sons and daughters. Methuselah lived 969 years, and then he died. Finally. That gum, bro. Die. Would you just go ahead and die, you know? And then when Lamech was 182 years, I mean, they're having kids on up there, y'all. Come on, y'all think it's tough at 40. Oh, you better have a kid. You're about to turn 40. Back then, you better have a kid. You're about to turn 180. Come on, have a, have a kid, you know? So, when Lamech was 182 years, he became the father of a son. Lamech named his son what? Noah. Hey, now, we know Noah. Does everybody know Noah? We all know Noah, okay? I mean, heck, people all over the world know Noah, all right? For he said, may he bring us relief from our work and the painful labor of farming this ground that the Lord has cursed. So Noah was actually going to bring some relief. There was going to be relief found in Noah and his descendants. It's just it was going to be an ugly relief. It was going to be a sad relief. But Methuselah's name means this. Check out who would want your name to mean. See, I, my name means gift of God. Does everybody know the, their, their, the meaning of their name? Nathan means gift of God. And he named that right because that's what I am. All right? but, but names were a big deal. They're not that big of a deal here. You know, we just, what you going to name? Well, I've been on Google. Huh? We'll just go with that one. You know, they don't really. Back then, it was a big deal, okay? Matter of fact, that there was Methuselah, I mean, uh, uh, Methuselah, yeah, Methuselah's name was prophesied to him, okay? So what you're getting is, is God was using Methuselah's name to let us know what was about to happen. It means his death shall bring judgment. Now, check this out now. Methuselah, this is what scholars and people that's got a lot more numbers and letters behind their name than I do, they say that Methuselah died seven days before the flood. Well, in Leviticus, God lays out the morning time period of when you lose somebody. You know how many days it is? Seven. So Methuselah dies. 
seven days before the flood, and then the righteous were taken out of the flood, Noah and his family were lifted up by the waters to escape judgment of God. So before judgment could come, the righteous had to escape. They had to be delivered. So then why, if, if, if the tribulation is for us, then why don't we see a picture of Noah swimming around in his family? Come on, guys, get to the boat. We're going to stay down here for a few more days. We're going to get there in a minute. We just got to go through a little bit of this so we can kind of know what's going on. Come on, guys, hurry, hurry, hurry. You don't see that going on. And all the animals are on there. Oh, oh, got the elephant up there. What's up, dog? What's going on? Yeah, we're good. We're good. Go ahead and show it. We're good. We're good. Now, they ain't struggling. They ain't having to deal with no judgment. No, they went in peacefully. Before a tribulation can happen, before the judgment of God happens, the righteous have to be rescued. Well, Nathan, what are you talking about? Dude, there's Christians in other countries that are getting their heads chopped off. They're burning them. Nero burned all types of Christians. You're going to tell me we ain't living in a time of tribulation? Oh, yeah, we are. Yeah, we are. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation tests and trials. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. One thing you need to know about that word tribulation I'm giving you guys a little Bible course right here, okay? Tribulation in John 16, 33, what he's meaning with that word right there is that we would have persecution. That's what that word means. Totally different than the word in, in uh, uh, Revelations. So in the persecution that you're seeing done and the tribulation and you're seeing some of these things happen, they're doing it by the hands of men. Hands of men are doing this. When you get to Revelations, friend, it ain't the hands of men doing anything in there. It's the hand of God that's coming down here wiping it all out. He's removing all things that hinder love. So it's a difference there, okay? We do see some regional tribulation and stuff. It's all regional. When the tribulation happens, it will be global. It's not going to be regional. Three quarters of humanity will be removed from the planet. So it will not be just a little, you know, a little pocket here. And we don't like all that happening. But again, when God's judgment begins to come on the earth, it will not be done by the hands of men. He'll have angels doing it. Genesis 7, 17 says, The flood, the great downpour of rain, was 40 days and nights on the earth, and the waters increased and lifted up the ark, and it floated high above the land. So we see Noah lifted up out of here and his family. Okay, That's the number two picture of a rapture or a catching away. He did not allow Noah to go through the judgment. And again, God's judgment is not on the earth. I've been telling you guys, I'll tell you this to the day I leave. Sin brings its own judgment. That means when you sin, like if I was to go and start doing meth today, okay, and I started doing meth, the fact that I'm doing the meth, which is sin, it would destroy my body. It would destroy my life because judgment is built into that sin I'm doing. So anytime you sin, there's judgment associated with the sin. That ain't God judging you. That's just the byproduct of sin. What does James say? That when sin enters in and when it gives birth, it births death? So see, there you go. I mean, it ain't got, well, you know, God's judging them, man. That pandemic came through here. God just judging the world. No, no, no. You have bumped your head on a rock or something. When God judges the world, my friend, it'll be way more than a coronavirus. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I'm telling you, it's going to be, it's going to be bad news, okay? Hallelujah. So Lot and his family are another example of the righteous being taken out of judgment. And this is where I want to kind of read a little bit of Scripture, so hang with me. Genesis 19, 17. It says, When morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Get up, take your wife and daughters, two daughters, who are here, and go, or you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. Now, a little bit of backdrop here. The angels were directed by the Lord to go down there and tell them, Hey, look. Lot, do you have any family members? Get your family members. Get out of here because we're getting ready to destroy this city. Okay? You need to get them all together. So Lot, he goes to his daughters and says, hey, we need to get out of here. Go. They went. Then he goes to their, their, their husbands and they laugh at him. They say, ha, 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 you're crazy, man. You know? So they stayed. So again, this is where we're at in the story. So, but Lot hesitated and he lingered. The men, or angels, took hold of his hand, okay, in verse 16, and the hand of his wife and the hands of his two daughters, because the Lord was merciful to him for Abraham's sake. Earlier on, Abraham interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, if we find 50 righteous, will you save it? Yes, I will. 40? Yes. 30? Yes. Went all the way down to 10. 
And he said, yeah, you find 10 people that are righteous, I'll spare the whole city. They couldn't even find 10 people that were right. They found four people that were right, we thought. We thought there was four. We're going to find out about number four. And it's got a lot to do with the church today. And they brought, him, they brought him out and left him outside the city with his family. Verse 17. When they had brought them outside, one of the angels said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you or stop anywhere in the entire valley. Escape to the mountains of Moab. Now remember that phrase, do not look behind you. Underline that, highlight that in your Bible. Okay? We're going to come back to that. And he said, But Lot said to them, to the angels, Oh no, not that place, not to the mountains. Please listen, your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have magnified your loving kindness, mercy to me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains because the disaster will overtake me and I will be killed. Verse 20, now look, this town in the distance is near enough for us to flee to, and it is small with only a few people. Please let me escape there. It is too small so that my life will be saved. And the angel said to him, behold, I grant you this request also. Again, a form of prayer. A form of pleading, okay? Um, and he said, I, 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 I grant you this request. He says, I will not destroy this town of which you have spoken. Hurry and take refuge there, for I cannot do anything to punish Sodom until you arrive there. Righteous existed. God is telling him, I can't do nothing in Sodom and Gomorrah until I get you out of here. Let that sink in. There's nothing going to happen. I know we got world leaders that are in the World Economic Forum. They're in all these places, United Nations, and they're drumming up plans to put a chip in everybody and to get everybody submitted, rule the world. Look, Psalms 1 tells us what God does with the kings of the world. He sits up in heaven and laughs at them. They're trying to put a plan to take over the world, y'all. Y'all need to know that, okay? That's what, you know, Charles Schwab and all those big people that got money, that's what they're trying to do, all right? And they're going to soft it a little bit, make it sound like they're not, but they're headed in a direction to rule the world. And we are the next target because we're holding them up because of our dollar and because of our capitalism, because of our freedom. They don't like that. They want us to bow to their socialism and all that stuff. But in the name of Jesus, we will not bow in Jesus' name. I know, I know, you know, the U.S., I mean, America is not in prophecy. Okay, I know people try to drum it all up. We ain't in prophecy. Okay, I'm just going to let you know that. You can sit there and try to take eat, bump, eat, lie, and put a bunch of words together and think we're, we're not in prophecy. Okay, all right? Now, we have a lot to do with what happens, okay, in prophecy and stuff like that. But we're not in prophecy. But again, there ain't nothing bad going to happen to I'm out of here and you're out of here. Amen? Hallelujah. Glory to God. He said, uh, let's go. Verse 23. The sun had risen over the earth when Lot came to Zoar. Then the Lord rained down brimstone, flame and sulfur, and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heaven. And he overthrew, demolished, ended those cities and the entire valley and all the inhabitants of the city wherever grew on the ground. Verse 25. Verse 26. But Lot's wife, from behind him, foolishly longing, looked back towards Sodom in an act of disobedience, and she became a what? Pillar of salt. Pillar of salt. Lot's wife represents the, the hypocrisy in church, the hypocrite in church. Got the look of a Christian, but their heart is in the world. She had a choice, and she picked the world. Once saved, always saved. Well, wait, 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 let's stop for a minute. Did the angels of the Lord save? Lot's wife? Yeah, they grabbed her hand and his hand and led them out of the city. So salvation was given to Lot's wife. She received salvation. And she began to walk in salvation for a little while. But then she said, I want what's back there. And you have multitudes of Christians that come in church all over the world just to check the box. Because as soon as they leave, they're going to cuss, they're going to drink, they're going to have sex with people they're married to, they're going to do whatever they want to do. And you think that's okay. See, see, the thing is with that is Lot's wife thought it would be okay just to take another look. She never lived to see what it was like after that. Hypocrisy will kill you. Being on both sides of the fence will kill you. Either get serious or get out. And I mean that. Don't come to this church pretending to be something you're not. 
I love you that much. I mean, because even God said in Revelation 3, he says, hey, look, you know what? I would rather you be hot or cold, but you're lukewarm. You're, you're a hypocrite, and I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. So if he's going to spew hypocrites out of the mouth, I want to stop you in your tracks and say, quit being a hypocrite and let's get right. Amen? And you're going to have that opportunity today. Amen? Hallelujah. So that, that's number three. We see three right there, right there of raptures. We see the judgment couldn't take place until the righteous people were removed from the city. The same is with all of us today. Judgment will not take place until all the righteous people are gone. And you know, some people won't even get serious until that happens. There's going to be people that are not going to get serious with God until people leave. And if you want to be that person and you're listening online, okay, and you didn't do what God told you to do, the rapture took place, and you find yourself in the middle of the tribulation. Go to Revelation chapter 20, and you will read what's going to happen to you. Because you will be beheaded. You will be destroyed. Because you will not have, especially if you're going to live for Jesus, and if you choose God, you're going to have to say no to worship in the beast, and you're going to have to say no to the mark. Of those two accounts, you will be destroyed for that. Except that island off of India. I don't think anybody's going to mess with that island. Okay. <laughs> They're going to have to deal with Jesus one-on-one, -on -one, okay? <laughs> I mean, ain't nobody going over there. But the reality is, if you are still here and you're listening to this YouTube channel, or if you're in this room and you're still here, don't take the mark of the beast. Because if you do, you're eternally damned. There is no hope for you. You're going to hell. Period. Thus saith Revelations. <laughs> Not Nathan. Okay, I'd like to give you an option B, <laughs> but I, I just work for the king. Hallelujah. You know, that's his call. We will see that judgment couldn't take place until the righteous people out here. After the church of Jesus leaves, then the tribulation period will begin shortly after that. And I've already said that. When you start seeing babies ripped out of mothers and you're seeing all this kind of chaos stuff going on, I think the tribulation starts right then because it's going to be horrible. The tribulation is a seven-year time period that the book of Revelation describes in great detail that will be the judgment of God on all, on all ungodly people on the earth. Some say that the church will go through half the tribulation, you know, all of the tribulation, but Jesus in the book of Revelation tells us that we will not be here when all these terrible things begin to happen. Jesus tells us that. So if you ain't going to believe nobody else, could we at least believe Jesus? He's the one coming, right? Revelation 3.10 says this. Because, and you might want to highlight this, because you have kept the word of my endurance, he's reading to a letter, I mean, a letter that's going to a church, my command to persevere, I will keep you safe from the hour of trial, that hour which is about to come on the whole inhabited world to test those who live on the earth. He's going to keep us from it. That means we ain't going to be a part of it. The word church is mentioned 19 times in the first three chapters of Revelations. Chapters 4 and 5, which I believe everybody should read chapter 4. That is a picture of the throne room of God. Man, if you don't read any other chapter in the Bible, read about the throne room of God. That is a beautiful picture. And, and chapter 5 just gives you a picture of his son coming into the throne room to get the scroll that Daniel talks about in Daniel, to undo that scroll and to begin to start the judgment time period. Chapters 6, and 19, 6 through 19 is the tribulation period. There is no mention of the church at all after chapter 3. None. Don't it seem to reason that if we're going to be here doing, during the tribulation, that there would be some mention of the church somewhere in there? Yes, it would. The angel told John after chapter 3, going into chapter 4, he said, come up here. Come up here. What's he doing? He's letting you everybody know, we're no longer down here. You're now up here. Let me let you see what you're going to see. Are you ready for the rapture? Is your life in God's hand? If the rapture were to take place right now, would you go or would you stay? Are you living a life that is expecting his arrival? Are you expecting him? I'm going to end the service with a story in Matthew 25. It's about the, uh, the ten virgins or the ten bridesmaids. And I want you all to listen to this, and then I'm going to say a few things, and we're going to close. But in verse 1, it says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The five who were foolish, you could say 
five of them were hypocrites and five of them were really Christians. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps, but the other five were, were wise enough to take along extra oil. Verse 5, when the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused by the shout, by the trumpet. Hallelujah. Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. Please pray for us. Hey, when you're going to church today, man, will you say a prayer for me? Hey, man, will you, will you pray for me? Hey, say a prayer for me, man. Could you, do, could, you, could, you, could you talk to the big man for me? Put in a word with the big man. That's, that's the five foolish bridesmen, a bridesmaid. But the others replied, we don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. But while that, because see, a relationship with Jesus is personal. It can't be shared. That means you can't bring somebody to heaven based on your relationship with God. you got to have a relationship with God. He said, but while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Uh, we're talking about a door, right? Noah went on to the boat, and they did what with the door? Who shut the door? God shut the door, not Noah. And again, nobody could get in. Same thing right here. Who's the door? Jesus is the door. Amen? He's the door that leads to life. Hallelujah. Later, when the other five bridesmen returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I don't know you. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or hour of my return. Do you know where this story is in the Bible? Matthew 25. Do you know in Matthew 24 at the end that I read at the beginning in Jesus saying you don't know the hour nor the day? That's at the end of 24. So he bounces right out of the end of 24 right into the 10 bridesmaids. He's letting us know you've got to be ready. Well, you know, my wife, she does all the praying. She's the prayer. Oh, my husband, you know, he does the praying. Ah, oh, man, you know, my husband, he does all that with God. I mean, I just stay here and, you know, what? Uh-uh. You have got, well, you know, I'm too young. I'm a teenager. You know, and, and I can't serve God. That, that would, would be serious like that, you know. No, no. You know, I'm six years old, and I can't give my life to God all the way. You know, I still got to play video games, and I still got to do this, and I got to do this. I got to eat up my whole day with stuff that means nothing to God at all. And it's okay because I'm seven. I'm 13. Oh, is it now? Says who? I hope your parents ain't saying it's okay. If they are, then I'm preaching to you as a parent. Get your kids off of electronic devices and get them in the Word of God. Get them in prayer time with you at home, not just at church. I'm bringing my kids to church to pray. We want your kids here at church to pray. But how about getting your kid and going in the living room and praying? you got them way more at home than you do here. Get your kids to fall in love with prayer at home. Hello. They want the church to do all the work, Dwayne. And we can do a lot, but we're not the parent. Man, I done kind of went crazy here now. I'm getting like a parent in here now. Raise your kids unto the Lord. Because there's a lot of kids that are made to do things in the name of God that when they get 18, they run away from God because they were made to do it. I did teen ministry. I know. I have teens call me up and talk about things they don't want to talk to their parents about. I have teens that have called me over the years, you know, wanting to serve God because their family ain't. They're going to church all the time, but they ain't serving Him. And parent, if that's you, repent today and come to Jesus Christ. Teenager, if you're just waiting on your parent to be able to serve God, quit it. Fall in love with Jesus today. You can make that decision today. Hallelujah. Jesus said in John 14, 1, he said, Don't be troubled. Trust in God and trust in me. There are many rooms in my Father's house. I would not tell you this if it were not true. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. After I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. Then I will take you with me so that you're with me. So you'll be there with me. 
in their day, uh, Jewish custom was that the, the, the bride and groom would come and sit down at the table, okay, with the father, all right? And then they would make a contract, and then they both would leave. The bride would leave, and she would get herself ready. The bridegroom would leave and go prepare a place for, her, for his bride. And then they would come up, and, and about a year later, and he would take his bride and take her to his abode, his place, his house. That's why, young girls, you don't date somebody that ain't got jack. You don't fall in love with some loser that ain't got nothing. Got a beat-up old car and ain't, ain't got no future, ain't, ain't striving for nothing. No, you don't do that. You wait for a man. You wait for a woman that's going to prepare themselves to where you live in the admiration of the Lord. Amen? So the question today is, are you ready to meet Jesus? Because in Revelation 20, 15, this is at the very end of Revelation 20, 15, before he goes into the New Jerusalem and the, and the really beautiful things, he says this, And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he or she was hurled into the lake of fire. Hurled into the lake of fire. Let's all bow our head, close our eyes. I want you to think for a minute. I know these words are a little bit heavy, but, but guys, your soul matters. And you need to put emphasis on where you're going to spend eternity. You don't need to play around with that. And I feel like sometimes messages just like this will get us thinking again that, look, there is an eternity, and it could be very soon for me, for you. We're not given our next breath. Or we're not promised it. That means we could literally leave here today, and it could be the last day. I may not see you next week. God forbid that happened, but I'm just saying it's a possibility. And I mean, it's, it's with teenagers, it's with young kids, it's with you know, older people, all of us, guys. And God is just making a plea with you today. Look, I don't want to see you go to hell. Jesus has done all he can do. He's, he's went to the cross. He, he's died for you. He raised himself back up. He, he, he's given his life for you. He's done everything he can do. But now it's up to you and me to say yes to Jesus. Say yes to what he's done. And all God is saying is, look, man, don't, don't do this life on your own. Let me be a part of your life. Put me front and center of your school. Put me front and center of your marriage. Put me front and center of your education or job or career. Put me front and center. Don't chase things that don't have eternal value on them. Chase me. Chase the things that I have for you. Get on fire for God. Turn your school upside down for Jesus. Be the change your school's looking for. Be the change your family's looking for. Be the change your, 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 the company you work for is looking for. Step up today. And maybe you're watching online and you're saying, you know what, man? I need to make my life right. I want to be that person. I'm, I'm ready to, to go all in for God. I'm, I'm tired of living the way I'm living and I want to make a new change, a new start. Well, I'm going to let you do that right now. If you're in this room and you say, Pastor, look, I don't know Jesus as my Lord. Or, Pastor, look, I once knew him, but like Lot's wife, I've kind of been looking back. I've been kind of playing both roles. I've been kind of one foot in, in the world and one foot in church. And I've kind of just been going both ways because I see my parents do it. So I figure it's okay. And it's not okay. You're not living this life for your parents. You're living this life for your God. And parents, the same with you guys. Introduce your kids to Jesus. And then live for Jesus in front of them so if you're here today and you want to make jesus the lord of your life or you want to come back to jesus and make a new fresh commitment i want you just to raise your hand and say pastor pray for me i want to make that decision i'm ready to get things right i'm ready to make things new right now today hallelujah well i'm going to go ahead and pray for, for, for you, maybe you didn't raise your hand, but I'm going to pray for those that are online. And we're just going to believe God that people surrender their life. So if you're watching and you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life, then just repeat this after me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. I ask you to forgive me right now of all my sins. And Jesus, I ask you to fill me up with your spirit. To give me the power to overcome the sin and addiction and problems in my life. Jesus, I make a commitment today that I'm giving you my whole life. I'm serving you with everything I have. In Jesus' name, I am yours and yours is mine. In Jesus' name. 
Everybody agree with that? Said, Amen, Amen.